I'd like to thank the Reverend Dr. Jack Sullivan, the Executive Director of the Ohio Council of Churches for being with us today, um, not only to bring us the invitation for the offering related to the anti-racism work of the Council, but also just for his very presence and his leadership in the rest of the service. Thank you so much, Jack. And also, I would say that um, when we were meeting at 10 this morning, Jack told us that his, in a previous life, right, as you were working with the Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ uh, to form curriculum uh, for anti-racism, he started writing material in 1990. And so he has been at this work for a long time, all your life, but, but thank you for your amazing work in this area. We continue the sermon series, Then and Now, uh, today we look at racism and caste, and this comes from a lot of sermon series through the years, or a lot of sermons through the years on racism particularly, um, but most significantly I want to shout out and thank my colleagues who were part of the sermon series in 2019 on 400 years of Africans in America. Um, as we acknowledge then the arrival of the first slaves in America in August of, 20, of, of uh, 1619. So would you join me in a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Reverend Dr. Otis Moss, Jr., Senior Emeritus Pastor of Olivet Institutional Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio, has been one of Ohio's and our nation's greatest prophetic voices for the past 70 years. Otis Moss, Jr., the son of Magnolia and Otis Moss, Sr., and the fourth of their five children, was raised in LaGrange in Troop County, Georgia. Born in February 1935, Otis Jr. was only two years old when his grandpa, Mitchell Moss, known as Grandpa Mitchell, passed away. Grandpa Mitchell was born into slavery in Meriwether County, Georgia in 1861. And I want you to grasp this for a second. Dr. Moss continues to be a presence of witness for justice and peace in this world today, and he has this memory and connection to slavery. That's amazing. Freed from slavery at four years old, Mitchell Moss rose in freedom, successfully running his agricultural business and over his lifetime accumulating 1,100 acres of farmland in Georgia. When the Great Depression hit, Mitchell and his land, were, Mitchell's land was stolen from him, was taken by white businessmen and government officials in Georgia and also in the federal government. He was swindled as his mortgage, uh, as he turned to his mortgage to help his family get through the depths of the depression. He went to do paperwork and his land was taken. Then it was declared that he had defaulted on a loan, which he didn't. When he died, he had very little to show for a lifetime of hard work and an incredible entrepreneurial brilliance as one born in slavery. However, Grandpa Mitchell's powerful story of rising in freedom is embedded in the Moss family oral tradition. Several years ago, Otis Moss Jr. was preaching at Branch Hebron Baptist Church in Odessadale, Georgia, where Grandpa Mitchell had been a deacon. And there, on the cornerstone of the church building, originally founded by former slaves in 1868, Otis saw the name Mitchell Moss carved into the stone. He was a founder at seven years old and part of the building team of Branch Hebron Baptist Church. And no one, no one could ever take that from him. Growing up in rural Georgia, it was family, church, 
and the African-American community that were the three pillars in the early life of Otis Moss, Jr., each was a sustaining force, and each was under constant attack. The family was constantly demoralized as fathers and mothers struggled to daily provide housing and food and opportunities for their children. And the church was a powerful witness for God, but whenever and wherever a black pastor addressed economic and racial inequality, the church was burned to the ground or bombed. And black schools at the heart of the community were, in the words of Otis Moss, Jr., inadequate, inadequately supplied, criminally neglected, structurally dilapidated, and filled with too many children in too small a space. And in spite of that, each day, he says, my school was filled with affirmation and love. With family, church, and community under persistent vitriolic racist attacks, each institution of his life nevertheless found ways to overcome what was happening. Dr. Moss says, each was a carrier of the liberation motif. They embodied faith and hope and love so that in the worst circumstances, a song, a sermon, a lesson, a prayer, a prophetic voice kept coming on often spoken in a language that only our black community understood. Ain't nobody gonna turn us around, he said. We had sung from the depths of our souls. We were marching to Calvary, we were marching to Freedom Land, and nothing could stop us. The grandson of a former slave, a man who he knew, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss Jr. rose from the racism and poverty of rural Georgia to come alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other leaders of the civil rights movement to fight for changes in this nation in his time and for all time, consistently and constantly battling and overcoming the pain of racism. In my book, The Genius of Justice, Dr. Moss tells his story but there are other geniuses there, 18 other African-American geniuses of justice. And in listening to their stories and their lives, it was apparent that every single African-American in my book encountered racial injustice as children, as teens, and then into young adulthood as people growing up in America. I shared six of these stories in a chapter in the book called Racism and Pain, Moving Against Time. Those stories told this that uh, including the stealing of the land from Mitchell Moss, there were church burnings and bombings, there was torture and murder, there were beatings and lynchings, and so many other forms of abuse. Verbal abuse as children and adults, physical and emotional harassment, threats of murder and racial divides, all because of, in their words, the color line. For more than 405 years in our nation, slavery, Racism, racial and economic violence have criminally altered lives and disrupted and destroyed families. One thing was clear in the depth of the conversations and the breadth of those conversations. When asked, how did you become who you are today? All 18 African-American geniuses went back to childhood and personal family memories to share the painful racist and discriminatory experience they had shaped, that had shaped their lives, 100% of them had experiences of firsthand racial injustice. And like Dr. Moss, it was almost always embedded in generations of memory and experience. To deny the depth of racism in America and its lasting impact on us to this present moment is like denying the existence of a transatlantic slave trade or denying or minimalizing the systematic elimination of Native American sisters and brothers or denying the Holocaust or denying that the climate is changing. To deny the horrible presence and pain of racism before today and up to this present moment is like saying that the sun did not come up this morning. It is real. It is present, it is a danger today, just as it has been throughout our history. For black Americans, 
This is too much a part of daily pain and experience. But racism is only the skin of the matter. Below the skin of racism are the structures of injustice known as caste. In 2020, Isabel Wilkerson authored one of the most important books of our time when she wrote Caste, The Origins of Our Discontents. In Caste, Wilkerson tells the story of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s pilgrimage to India in the winter of 1959. Dr. King went on pilgrimage to see the land of Mahatma Gandhi, the father of nonviolent protests. Dr. King had recently finished leading the year-long Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama, was, was the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, and he wanted now to meet the people whose battle against the oppressive rule of Great Britain had inspired his own fight for justice in America. During his month-long stay, at the invitation of Prime Minister Nehru, he sought out the so-called untouchables, the lowest caste in the ancient Indian caste system. Isabel Wilkerson takes us to the southern tip of India, to the city of Trivandrum in the state of Kerala. There, Martin and Coretta King visited high school students whose families had been untouchables. The principal introduced Dr. King this way. Young people, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. In Wilkerson's words, King was floored. He was not happy. He had not expected the term to be applied to him. He was, in fact, really put off by it at first. He had flown from another continent and had dined with the prime minister. He was the Nobel Peace Prize winner. And for a moment, he wrote, I was shocked. I was peeved that I would be referred to as an untouchable. Then he began to think, to think of the reality of the 20 million people consigned to the lowest rank of American society for centuries. In his words, we were still smothering in the airtight cage of poverty. We were quarantined in isolated ghettos. We were exiled in our own country. And finally, he said to himself, yes, I am an untouchable. And every black person in the United States of America is an untouchable. More than 62 years ago, in a high school in Trivandrum, India, Dr. King came to realize the truth of the American caste system. Black people in America are treated almost exactly like the untouchables of India. We also have a caste system in America, and in case you didn't know this, Mart uh, uh, Adolf Hitler studied the way we put black people in place so that he could duplicate that in his treatment of Jews and gays and comedians in his own society. He mimicked us to show how to do it even better. Wow. King would speak to caste in the final years of his life, but it was not a major theme of his speaking or his writing. It took the brilliant research and expository writing of Isabel Wilkerson to uncover this in 2020 and reveal the long and twisted history of caste. Caste is the unseen structure of systematic injustice in America. America is an old house, and it's built on a faulty foundation with an infrastructure of slavery and caste. Wilkerson writes, caste and race are neither synonymous nor mutually exclusive. They can and do exist in the same culture and serve to reinforce each other. Race in the United States is the visible agent of the unseen force of caste. Caste is the bones, race is the skin. Race is what we can see, the physical traits that have been given arbitrary meaning and become shorthand for who a person is. Caste is the powerful infrastructure that holds each group in its place. The untouchable Dr. King, in all his brilliant, provocative, and powerful ways, was able to recognize this long before most people did. He was not the first American to write about this or speak about the structure of our old house, whose foundation stones were laid in 1619, 
when the first slave ship arrived on our shores. Ashley Montague in 1942, Gunnar Myrdal in 1944, wrote books about our caste system in America. And then the Indian untouchable Ambedkar, who came to America to study economics in 1913, wrote about it. He reached out to meet and talk with W.E.B. Du Bois, and Du Bois had already written about these comparisons, but together they were able to develop these concepts and comparisons between India and America. And uh, Ambedkar actually rejected the term untouchables and even the term that Gandhi used, Harajans. He instead chose to call his own people Dalits. Dalits, which means broken people. He saw the pain and the brokenness of his people and felt they needed their own word to name and claim their own reality. Again, caste is the bones, race is the skin. The bones of America are broken. Our system is broken. Black Americans are broken in this old house built on sand 405 years ago on a foundation of injustice. White people especially often get caught up in arguing about this and say, no, it's not as bad as you say. You make it sound so bad. Look, we had a black president. Look, another woman is running for president who is African American and Asian. And, and then you sort of miss the point. We miss the point because it's about the whole picture that we lose. However, we need to rebuild the foundation on a solid rock foundation of justice for all. It will take all of us naming each of the broken bones in our structure and the injustice there to build a new just body. Just take away the discovery of the untouchable Dr. King and the revelations of the incredible Isabel Wilkerson to name our caste system for what it is. Then we can build a new house on a solid foundation. On the, on the walls of my study, there are beautiful pictures of African-American women and men. They are Breonna Taylor and Rhea Melton, Hank Aaron and Jackie Robinson, Satchel Paige and Bill Willis, and the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey P. Key. Brianna and Rhea are martyrs of violence against women of color. Hank and Jackie and Satchel are my sports heroes from baseball. They were the people that have been with me all my life. In America's greatest game through the years, um, now Bill Willis Sr., who broke the color barrier in pro football in 46 and was a member here for 43 years, is like a second dad to me, was. And Jeffrey's my brother. The loving spirits and memories of each of these women and men remind me daily of the millions who battle against racism and injustice. They inspire me to stay on the path of anti-racism. They guide my steps each day in the battle against our caste system and the racial injustice and inequities that are embedded in it. I encourage everyone here and everyone listening to vow to be an anti-racist beginning now. If you've already begun, good for you. And even if you've not experienced racism and caste firsthand, you live in this old house, we all do, and you know it is real. Also, you know pain yourself in your own life from things that have come at you and hurt you, and you know what that feels like. Acknowledging the pain and the hardship that more than 41 and a half million black Americans are still facing in many ways, and then making choices to be a part of bringing new life and hope to others who have experienced this pain and the cast in America is for each of us the job we should do, we should all commit to. And I want you to remember two names, Antonio and Isabella. They are the only two names which were retained from the manifest of the ship that brought 20 odd slaves. You know the sadness of this manifest is we don't even know how many slaves came on that first ship, 20 and odd, whatever that means, on August 25th, 1619. Antonio and Isabella and the 20 and odd sisters and brothers who came from Africa in chains in 1619 are our ancestors in our American life. I think of them much more as my ancestors than I do Martha and George Washington. We need to remember and honor all of our ancestors forever. Remember these words from Fannie Lou Hamer. There are two things we should never forget. 
We should never forget where we came from, and we should never forget the bridges that carried us over. This is a truth for all of us, not just for some of us. For white Americans, our encounters and experiences with racism and deeply rooted twin caste are often a learned experience. They're not something we may have felt in our bones the same way. It is not as visceral a reality. The aggressions and microaggressions that are experienced regularly by our black and brown brothers and sisters. As I've said many times, the first and most prevalent reality that I think of when I think of white privilege is that as a white person, I can walk away from racism at any moment on any day. I don't have to deal with it in some ways. That's privilege. I saw this in the protests following the lynching murder of George Floyd. Some people came out of those protests walking away saying, well, I stood strong for racism and haven't done anything since. We must commit each day to our, of our lives to live, breathe, and act as anti-racists in America. I turn to the literary, literary genius and my guiding light on racial critique, James Baldwin, to take us out today. He writes, because even if I should speak, no one would believe me. And they would not believe me precisely because they know, would know that what I said was true. And Albert Einstein, around the same time, wrote these words about racism in America. If the majority knew the root of this evil, then the road to its cure would not be long. So let us tell the story. In the words of Genesis 4.10, let us tell the story about our brothers and sisters' blood crying from the ground. There are 405 plus years of genuine and justifiable anger in the soul and the bones of black America. Racism and caste are the skin and bones of the matter. And God is calling each and every one of us to hear the cries from the ground and the cries above the ground and to respond with justice and love for all. And until we do, the skin and bones of America's original sin will keep crying to us. Amen.